Good evening. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here for EdChat Interactive. Tonight, we're going to have a session on building a safe, personalized learning community with Andy Wallace and, we hope, uh, Leo Grimm. Um, and uh, Andy and Leo are both featured speakers at FETC, um, which is how we got them. And uh, FETC has said that if you go ahead and register for FET at FETC.org and use the code EC1101, EC for EdChat 1101 for the date, uh, you can receive a 10% discount. So um, if you want to see them live uh, down in Orlando, Florida, uh, register, at, register for FETC. But tonight you're going you're gonna to see them live and you're going you're gonna to be able to interact with them um, about uh, building this a safe personalized learning community. I'd like to talk just a little bit about EdChat Interactive for the and also the Shindig platform. Uh, EdChat Interactive was started by myself, Tom Whitby, and Steve Anderson. And our goal was to find educators who are doing really interesting things and give them a forum to share what they're doing with other educators. We wanted to do it in a way that was different from the way webinars work, something that was more in line with the way we all learn, something that was more conversational. So uh, we decided on this format and we were using the Shindig package that allows you all to interact with each other and you all to interact with the presenters a lot more. And that's gonna be the format tonight is there's gonna be times where, where we ask you to form groups to pair up with in groups of two, three, or four people and talk about an issue among yourselves. And then there's going to be times where we ask people to volunteer to come up on stage and talk about those things with, with every, you know, in front of everybody else. So where I hope that you participate because that's part of, of the, the learning process. And since you were all in education, anyhow, you know that that's how we, we learn best. Now, in order to do that, we're using the Shindig platform. So uh, just a few things about Shindig. Um, there's a mute mic button near your avatar. Uh, if you find that there's feedback, sometimes by clicking that mute mic button, uh, you can stop the feedback. Uh, there's going to be times where we ask uh, for volunteers to come up on stage. Uh, and if you're willing to come on stage, which we really hope that you are, then you'll press that raise hand button. I'll see that you're volunteering to come up on stage and we'll bring you up. Then to the left of the raise hand button, there's an ask question button. That allows you to ask a question. That question then goes to me and I can pass it on to our presenters. Um, so, uh, so that's another way of interacting. And then uh, to the left of that is a text chat button. And I'd like you all to click on the text chat button and open up the text chat window. And you should see something that looks a little bit like this. I'm going to make it full screen for a second so you can see it, see it a little bit better and then uh, shrink it back. Um, and notice that there's a top, there's an X on the top right, which allows you to close it. If you grab the top, you can move it. So it's, a, it's away from uh, the, the screen. And then at the bottom is where you can enter in information that everybody else can see. I'd like you to just put in something about where you're from and maybe uh, something that you'd like to learn tonight to, sh to share with everybody else. Now, it just so happens that there's one person tonight who can't see what's going on in the text chat, and that's me. So I'll have to take your word for it that you're actually typing stuff in. And, um, you know, and Leo and Andy will hopefully be able to see that. And then the, the uh, real reason why we've chosen Shindy, because all of those other features are cool, but not necessarily outstanding. But the reason we've chosen the Shindig package is it allows you all to form small groups. So you'll see that your avatar is in the middle and you'll see that there's enough, there, the avatars of the other participants. If you click on the avatar of another participant or groups of two participants, if they're already talking, uh, you can get into conversations with other with the people who are here. And that's really a key part of the experience in these EdChat interactives. And I'd like to encourage you all to do that. So if you could, um, what happens is you click on the avatar of the other person, then you form groups like this group here is shown. I'll just make this larger again so you can see it a little bit better and if you see in your in the group there's going to be an x the x allows you to separate from the group so i'd like to encourage you all for the next minute or two to form groups 
and introduce yourself and uh, talk a little, a little about your experiences forming safe, personalized learning communities with other people here. I'm going to pull myself down for a minute, and then uh, I'll come back, uh, introduce Andy and Leo, and we'll get officially started. An opportunity, I've seen most of you had an opportunity to connect with at least one more person, and I hope those conversations were, were interesting. Um, they'll get more interesting as we go, because we'll, we'll have specific topics. Um, I will say, I can't find Andy in the, in the participants, so I'm hoping that he, he had some computer problems a little bit earlier. But uh, let me go on. So um, in about three weeks, on November 20th, uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, some of the issues that we have with technology. And, the, and sometimes the way we go about solving the issues really is counter to what we really want. And so the title of this one is, should we ban cell phones is really the wrong question. And so to find out what the right question is, uh, we're going to have a discussion with Lee Watanabe Crockett and with Andrew Churches. So that should be another fun, interesting evening. And I hope that you can all join us. Just go to, well, you already know how to do that, right? Go to edchatinteractive.org, click on upcoming web events, and, um, and, and join us for that event. So let me, um, let, let me now find Leo um, and bring him up. And as you can see from the slide, between Leo and Andy, they've got 21 years as educators. Um, they've both been technology and IT directors at schools and districts. And they're national keynoters and FET feature speakers. And Leo, welcome, welcome yeah. to Edge Interactive. So thank you, um, thank you, Mitch. I, I apologize for Andy. You know he's up in Maine. Lots of black bears there. Um, we'll send out a search party, and uh, we'll see what happens. I apologize. Um, so actually, uh, we each have twenty-one years each. Actually, uh, really, in Cause, yeah. Because in your biographies, it listed one of you is fourteen and one of you is seven, and so I I pulled out no, my calculator just, and I added them up, and it came up to that's twenty-one. Just the, that's just the age we act. That's that's it. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually uh, I began education as an undergrad. Um, so my mom was a ed uh, lifelong educator. She told me never to go into education so I could make a real living. Uh, oh well. So, oh well. Sorry, mom. But it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more it fun playing with the fun. It is a lot more fun. Absolutely. So glad to see we have so many teachers on here tonight, Mitch. Um, you know, we have quite a few people. I was happy to see that because this, you know, this workshop is actually geared towards, you know, um, helping leaders uh, of your districts to, um, you know, plan effectively for personalized learning within your schools, you know, and be able to lead effectively, um, mm -hmm. you know, to support that through, uh, you know, through their leadership. And, you know, when Andy and I were kind of unpacking our workshop and how we were going to present it on this platform, you know, we had this completely rethink what we were going to do. So, um, we're and, and to now, doing. and now you get to rethink it again because he may not be, he may not even be here. So if you yeah, want no, no. for, for a while, I can, you know, I can stay up, but I'm going to pull my slides down and no, I'll get okay. your slides. I'll yeah. You know, we can pull Eric Butash up here because, you know, he's lived a lot of it with us. Oh, what do we got? Oh, that's the, oops, that's the wrong slide. Sorry. Um, Oh, see, that was the climactic uh, ending. Everyone knows, right? Well, oh well, but it was—it wasn't up long enough for them to really. Um, see, everyone realizes right now that Andy is scrambling around to find an internet connection that works. Right. <laughs> really, I feel bad for him. I really do. I really want to put his like. I want to put up his okay. email address and have everyone send an email telling him not to worry about it right now, uh -huh. so, or at least tweet about it. I think it'd be great. Ah. So somehow or other, I'm not finding that file. No, you just had it. Okay, can you see it? Because I oh, there it is. Okay, got it. Okay. Well, now I can't see it, but you can't see it. Now I can't see it. I, can. I, see the, I see the square. Oh, that's cool. You see it now? No, but that's okay. What's the next? I have it. You up just on see my the square. Screen. But the, so um, maybe uh, p could people raise their hands if they could see that slide? It should be a slide of three parts with a girl in the middle. Um, 
Okay, so okay, so you all can see it. Um, so okay, so we're on the first slide. I I'm gathering then that that people can see it. So um, okay. uh, let's you know you you already have them um, on on your computer. You have them printed out, I, I guess, right? Yeah, I have a I have a dual screens here, so I have them up okay. on my screen. So good. Okay. Um, yeah. So. I so do you want me to do you want me to bring Eric up? Yeah, we could bring or do you Eric want up. To... Oh, we'll put him on the spot, huh? Andy okay. said he'd be in in a second. He just texted. But actually, let's kick off the conversation. So um, obviously we're we're talking about building a safe personalized learning community and you know and um, we you know when we talk about the word safe, um, you know, we're talking a little bit about security, but this is about um, you know um, social emotional learning as well. So it's it's like socially safe. And mm -hmm. uh, psychological safety, you know, is uh, one of the things that uh, we like to talk about throughout our, our workshop. So um, that goes for anyone in this crowd who wants to, wants to raise their hand, ask a question, and take part in the conversation. Um, you know, we could have Eric Butash up here. He's a big, uh, you know, big fan of digital citizenship and a, and a leader in that space. And I and I know that he likes to uh, do that combination with personal with uh, personalized learning and social emotional learning in the in the schools. And I think there's a, a healthy conversation to be had, um, you know, when we put those two subjects together. And obviously, everyone should know that, you know, we work with Eric um, on a regular basis uh, and the great work that they're doing at the Highlander Institute in Rhode Island. And um, so, Mitch, and are you advancing slides since I can't see them? But, uh, right now, I'm still on the first slide. Do you want me to advance to the second? Let's go to slide three, and I'll introduce myself in that sense. And, and Okay, we're on slide three. Me. Okay. Um, that's so funny. I really can't see it, but, um, so my name is Leo Brem. Uh, as Mitch mentioned, I'm a 22 year veteran in education. Uh, I've been a IT director in Sharon public schools, Newton public schools and, um, Northboro, Southboro public schools. And then I decided to go more regional over the last six months. And I am now working for collaboratives in the state of Massachusetts. So I can work on more, uh, statewide, initiatives and it's been a breath of fresh air um and with that i got to choose my own title so um and the challenge that was put forward to me by my some of my friends was to pick a title that has an acronym of my first name so you'll see that on the learning evolution officer um so or the leo and i know matt joseph is laughing right now at me so um and, and you'll see the my twitter handle and if you have any Thing you want to talk about good or bad you can definitely uh you can tag me on twitter uh, i take any kind of feedback um, or suggestions and or comments so because uh i'm a lifelong learner and i will take any of that in and i feel completely safe about it in our personalized learning safety uh protocol can we go to slide four and i'll introduce andy yes go ahead you're we're up to, to work yeah, for Andy. So, uh andy wallace what, what can I say about Andy? He is a, he pretty much is the state of Maine. Um, he uh, has a full experience as a teacher, librarian, librarian of the year a couple of years ago, um, and a great colleague and a peer to work with um, on statewide initiatives. And so one of the initiatives that hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about tonight is our uh, Open Education Resource Initiative, or OERs. We are, we're building out uh, statewide repositories to share to school districts so that integrate directly into your learning management systems, whether it's Google Classroom, Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, whatever the case may be. Uh, and we've put, um, along with Eric Putash from Highlander, uh, we've put some uh, considerable time and in planning into this over the last uh, 12 to uh, 14 months. And uh, oh, it comes Andrew Wallace. So, and once um, he's up, I'll pull myself down, just as long as he can. Uh, oh, no ah, video, Andrew. but audio. We'll oh, there it. he is. There he is. Are you there? And so as I was saying about Andy, you know, <clears throat> what can I say? <laughs> okay, I'm going to pull myself down then, because you don't need me yeah. now. Okay, I'm Andy. I'm a poor substitute for Andy. Okay, Andy, we're, um, I was just about introducing you on your slide. And I was uh, well, hear me? all kinds of bad things about you. Go ahead. Yeah, everything you said is not even true. Uh, never been a teacher. Uh, just, no, I'm kidding. Um, my name's Andy Wallace. Thank you for that kind introduction, Leo. Um, 
kind of jumped in late. I apologize for the technical difficulties and the great irony of the technology being sort of invisible and easy is uh, just sort of allied by my own experiences. So we thank have to you for that whole slide. We have to do the, the whole slide on this. <laughs> Perfect. Go ahead. All right. So anyway, as Leo said, uh, I've got a fair amount of experience in, uh, in schools, and I really believe in making the technology as simple as possible. I don't have a technology background, and so I was someone that sort of just struggled through it and learned. And I'm excited to live and work in an era where technology should just work. And, uh, and it did. It just took about 15 minutes to get there. Thanks for the video. Keep going. I don't want to slow you all down already. Yeah, when there. Well, yeah. uh, did you have a backup lesson? Because remember, later yeah. on, you know, we wanted to you know, make sure you raise your hand, too. So if you have a comment uh, in the crowd that uh, Mitch can see you and put, put you forward. Uh, but we were commenting earlier on how, um, not to jump too far ahead, but um, remember when teachers were afraid to go into the computer lab because uh, our advice to them was, if it didn't work, have a backup lesson plan, right? And uh, and how absurd uh, most teachers thought that was because they put so much work into their main lesson plan in the first place. And then we would sit there and say, oh, you should have a backup one in case the lab doesn't work. And just how absurd that is. And we would never ask them to do that today. Um, but I would say, um, Andrew, for the future uh, shindigs, you may want to borrow Eric uh, Butash's Khajiit uh, as your backup internet connection. Uh, so, <laughs> all right, Mitch, let's go to the next slide. OK, Andy, can you see the slides? I can. Yep, I got them. So Oops. this is about personalizing it. Yeah. OK, so I, I just can't. You can. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So when we think about personalized learning, you know, I mean, that's a very broad, you know, um, you know, when Andy and I were talking about this and how we were going to approach this workshop, you know, with the leaders in January, um, you know, what's that definition of personalized learning? And, you know, everyone kind of has their own, you know, twist on it. Some people say that differentiation is not personalized learning. I know I, I kind of feel as though that, um, Teachers have always been natu uh, naturally drawn to personalize a learning experience for, for students. Um, but when we were doing some research, Dreambox had a pretty good, um, you know, a pretty good definition of it, uh, which you see there. And, you know, just a quick question to the crowd. What, what is, you know, what is something that always jumps out, you know, in that learning part, right? What Can anyone have any comments about that? What is something about personalized learning that, um that you think of, or what's uh, what's an alternative word for you for personalized learning? And I guess if it's not differentiation, what might it be? Mitch is coming in. Yeah, why don't we, do folks here know how to use the interactive features of this? Because this is probably yeah, probably we, a good yeah, we like sort of minute over it. Right. So I was I was actually just popping up to tell people that they should use that chat feature um, if they want to type in what they think about personalized learning, or even better, if you're willing to come up and talk about your thoughts about personalized learning, um, Andy and Leo don't bite. I, um, you know, I've, I've been online with them before and I'm fine. So uh, just raise your hand and I'll bring you up and it, it, you should you have an enjoyable conversation with them. But I'll bring myself down. So if you want to come up and talk about, you know, what, what you think of personalized learning, Raise your hand if you can type some things into the chat box. That that would be great as well. Uh, and there's a there's a hand. Okay. Who do we got? <laughs> tell tell us about personalized learning, Matt. Well, I want. I think this in itself is is for me was personalized learning to try and, and and join in the conversation and actually raise my hand and and get on stage. But I think one of the things that I took away from this last week for personalized learning is more discovery learning for students, having an opportunity to be active in what is learning in the classroom. And if the educators who are planning the lessons and activities create um, a creative space to have active participation, then it be students own their own learning. And then it's not only personal, but then, then when they share what they learned, then it brings other people in and it encourages um, more collaboration as well. So I think for me, 
one participating like things like this is how to learn how to engage in personalized learning as an adult, but then sharing that with staff and educators so they create lessons where people take ownership um, in what they're what they're doing. Matt, what is you know what are the, some of the strategies that you use to um, to encourage teachers to kind of engage uh, outside the box, right? Because what you're talking about, you know, some of the things that Andy and I were talking about today were. Um, when we do our exercises, we always we do a, an unpacking exercise and we always come up with certain challenges that people engage and say that get in the way of trying to shift their pedagogy, try something new, right? Lots of mandates. Uh, there's just not enough time. How do, how do you manage no. that, Milford? So one of the things uh, that, uh, so I was, I've been a principal before the going into the, the technology field um, for 11 years. One of the things we always would drill into teachers is write objectives, put I can statements on the board, you know, that very um, research-based instruction. What I'm really trying to do to increase, increase personalized learning is actually finish with I did statements instead mm -hmm. of I can statements at the beginning. Actually have students in the wrap-up Right, I did statements. So then they're actually in the closure of the lesson, talk about what they did during that whatever, 45 to 75 minutes, whatever the class is, because they then own the learning, which goes back to the first thing that I said. It That's when it becomes personalized and relevant. I mean, we could talk for hours about relevancy in, in learning too, but I think that's one of the shifts that I'm trying to bring into this role is to have students more engaged, active, and then at the end, write what they did. Anybody else? Have, what do you think of that, Andy? No, that sounds that sounds really good. I think the the next part we're going to be able to talk a little bit more about um, uh, about you know what you're talking about sounds wonderful. What what can we do to make sure this is happening? And I think as a group, I don't know if Leo said it, and I apologize if you did, but you know we're going to be doing a longer session down at FETC. More for like technology directors, but this group has a lot of librarians and integrators and looking at people out there, uh, teachers, and you know, it's really you're the ones who live in that environment too. So we want to make sure that we're hearing from people who actually have to operate in these environments rather than some top down uh, techie CEO approach to managing this. Because if you're not doing the work that Matt describes and doing uh, engaging students in that, then really what's the point? So Hopefully, we'll get into a little more of the barriers that we have to making this all work, and then we'll try to um, knock down some of those barriers or help you do hey, that. Hey, Mitch, why don't you try pulling the slides down and putting them back up? I'm, I'm getting a couple of chats here in the chat window that they can't see the slide. Not that the slides are super, you know, impactful. I was going to say, the slides are not that important, honestly. That's right. This, this conversation is not really good at it. I have to say, this is really more, really more of a conversation. And any resources that we that we will reference, we'll uh, email to the participant, participants. Actually, we went over that. Yeah, we will post those. Yeah. Mitch is uploading. So, can you see them now? Because I took them <clears> down, <throat> and it's back up on the personalized learning slide. Uh, I say I got a yes. Some people can see them. I still can't, but that's okay. I made them. So let's go to slide okay. six if we can. So why are we here today? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Why are we here today? Okay. I mean, you kind of told us why we're here today. Mitch told us to be here today, first off. Uh, that's, that's that's my job. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Mitch said you need to be here. And we're excited to try a, a less uh, sit and get style webinar format. So when I heard, when I met Mitch and heard about this uh, shindig, it sounded really neat to me. And again, we're hoping to sort of have a, the best sort of relationship for a lot of us is a symbiotic relationship, right? So we hope to give you a little bit, but we also hope to get a bit from you all. And so that's why coming up on stage, I thought it was such a neat idea because you know, as whoever said it, someone smarter than me and someone smarter than all of us, but someone who is not as smart as the room, right? The smartest person in the room is the room. So the more we can get together and talk about things, the better off we're going to be. Now, Leo is an amateur historian, and he's going to give you his version <laughs> of uh, education is sort of evolved. And then we're going to bring it right back into personalization. So here we go. And uh, well, someone please back so to what he was What he was referring to is I have this... I just say that we've always personalized learning and education, you know, and everyone in this show has probably taken a, you know, a history of education course throughout 
um, Horseman and so on, you know, and where we started with the one room schoolhouse and, you know, that one room schoolhouse was a multi-age classroom uh, where the older kids helped uh, instruct the younger kids, which helped reinforce their learning and so on and so forth. And, you know, over time after the industrial revolution, you know, we replicated that one room schoolhouse into a, uh, you know, multi one room schoolhouse. And then we started separating kids out by age and, um, and skill level. And, you know, I think the, the innovation of today is that the technology, you know, I think we call it the egg carton, right? The, the term is we've created the egg carton. And um, I think the technology, the innovation is the technology can crack that egg carton open. You know, we can actually, you know, you know, salvage the best parts of what that run, one room schoolhouse were, you know, was and, um, and bring back things like, um, you know, uh, apprenticeship, Right and, uh, and uh, how that exists in our schools today, and I bet you some people in the room today have some examples of peer actually helps. Uh, you know, find. I think I opened up a <laughs> a teacher evaluation for one of my schools today, and there was still thirty five examples. Almost fell out of my chair. I said, "Who is going to do that? I would never do it." So, um, you know, I think you know that's the. I think we've always personalized learning. Um, the art form of teaching is the fact that they want to personalize and meet students where they are. And um, even though it's a buzz, uh, bridge blended learning to help personalize the learning experience. Um, you know, I can quote with, if someone wants to put more jargon on the chat, I'll mention it for sure. Um, but we have no shortage of jargon um, that, we can absolutely um, leverage technology effectively to meet the learner where they are. And I just don't think ed tech is doing a great job of it today. I think that, um, you know, how many people here, you can, you can raise your hand on your screen. How many people have an Amazon Prime account or just have used Amazon in the last month, right? And uh, when you log into Amazon, it tells you exactly what you want to read next. You probably, are interested in what it's suggesting to you. You know, you may it may suggest a new squash racket that you want to buy. You know, at least my Amazon does because I bought a squash racket for a friend three years ago and it thinks I need a new one. So, and I don't even play squash. So, um, however, that's technology at its best, right? That's personalizing the experience. And, um, you know, we, all, we live with it day in and day out now as adults and we just aren't doing it. The technology is not delivering it in education just as effectively as it could. So, and that's... Well, that's kind of what our workshop is focused on is how to start moving in that direction using the technology effectively to move that bar forward. So, uh, but you know, to be fair to teachers though, you know, you went from this one room schoolhouse and you had, you know, I don't know, 15 kids of different ages. And so, um, you were 15. always personalizing, right? 15, 20, whatever. But now we're looking at, you know, 25 to 30 kids all, uh, sort of, um, heterogeneously mixed into one space. And so we talk about differentiation as if that's personalization. And that's more like you're all on the same, you're all on a different page in the same book, right? So I think it's important to distinguish between those two things. But, you know, I always like to say that technology has made things that were previously impossible now possible. Differentiation on a, a large scale. And then the next step is beyond different, differentiation to personalized learning. And so, um, but I wonder though, if it's now much easier, not completely easier, but much easier, you know, why isn't this happening everywhere? And so if you all would indulge me and like, let's leverage the, this tool here, Shindig, and maybe get into a couple groups, maybe two groups and talk amongst ourselves about what are the overarching challenges. So do you guys know how to organize into a group? And I'm sure Mitch explained that. Maybe we could do two groups or three groups, or if you're not a group person, sit in your own group. And then I'd like to pop down and listen in and see what we'll you guys are doing. Yeah, yeah we'll I do in. two good groups. Yeah. So this is going to be the, yep. So this is really the time then uh, we, we want to discuss about is in your classrooms and in your schools, what's preventing you from doing real personalized learning? And as you say, it's, you know, we're not really talking about differentiating. This is not just a matter of, 
pre preparing one kid better for a test or each kid better for a test. This is really personalizing the learning. What are, what are the obstacles that you're facing using technology to help you personalize? And then we want to get those. And then if you come up with a good list, then when Leo and Andy come back up, they're going to give you all of the solutions to that, right? Every single one of them. No Every single one of them. Okay. Okay. So click on the avatar of another person. If you don't have a mic or if you don't want to do that, then at least type in the chat box, um, you know, some of your ideas about the overarching challenges. And then Andy and Leo are going to come down. They're going to talk with you also. And I'll bring myself down as well. So uh, there goes Leo. There goes Andy. And now I'm going down too. And please talk. Okay. Let me bring Leo up. And in a second, I'll bring Andy up also. Um, okay. So, so Leo, so so what do you? So Andy's in. Uh, they're they're having too good a discussion. He didn't want to yeah, quite we were leave doing, yet. Yeah, we were doing pretty well too. I probably could have got another minute, but that's okay. Um, you know, we had a pretty good conversation. You know about siloed data. Um, Eric uh -huh. brought up uh, information about uh, data to drive decisions, right? Uh, both, you know, from a district level down to a teacher level. Um, and I think what, what Eric was suggesting is that we have so much data at our fingertips because of the technology we're using today um, mm -hmm. right. that we're not effectively using it, right? I brought up the Amazon experience. You know, right. we, we can't do that. We can't do that today in, in technology because it's, um, you know, in education because we're not effectively organizing our data. It's all in silos. And so uh, Eric... Uh, you know, brought that up. And it's a conversation you know, Andy, Eric, and myself have had, you know, quite a few times about, you know, how are we going to effectively, um, not about big data, but what we what we call learning analytics. So uh, what's the uh, data we're going to use to meet that student that's right there, right now in front of us that has a problem, right? Or more really, importantly, yeah. how can the technology offer up a suggestion to the learner so they can help them own their own learning, right? Well, one of the things that was interesting to me is is I was I got into a conversation this summer with somebody who's, um, I guess she's she's a PhD, but she's some executive having to do with learning analytics at Pearson, and she was saying that one of the issues is they don't really they don't really know what data is really important to to track because you, you know you you have some type of learning content up there and the um the, the kids are, are, are doing stuff but a lot of the data that they could conceivably accumulate when you really look at the data it doesn't lead to good advice as to what the kid should be doing next um so they're so they're struggling with with that the um you know the the content providers is figuring out what data and how and how to report it so it's just kind of an interesting fact, uh, factoid. And and Andrew, yeah. you you were Andy, you you were involved with an interesting conversation as well, right? Yeah, I was, and it was um, interestingly coming more from coming from the uh, the the classroom side or the digital coach side, which is like time. How do we make enough time to do the work that is involved in personalized learning? And of course, mm -hmm. that's the age-old question: What do we let go of, and what do we keep? Uh, and so, I've had this theory for a while around: um, Do we have too many tools in our toolbox? So, there's a slide in there somewhere, and I apologize—I don't know the number of it, but um, I think it's a couple slides up. I think it's the last slide, actually. Um, is it? What's that? The. Um... Anyway, the whole point is this. Are we looking at, you know, app sprawl? Do we have too many apps? When was the last time we piloted something and we let it go instead of keeping it around? Oh, are, right. Um, okay. I guess the are there too many tools was the ninth one. Sorry. Yeah. So I guess the goal so, that we've always been trying to push in our district is how do we go deeper with less? We're finding that we all go out, we find the app that we really like, and it serves a really excellent purpose. But it's actually kind of similar to another app that we're using, one of our colleagues might be working. And what I, I see eroding our ability to be efficient and support one another is this concept of app sprawl. And I don't just mean apps, I mean any sort of online service or piece of software, or even an approach to teaching 
that might be completely divergent from what a lot of our colleagues are doing. And so we've been encouraging people to sort of compromise a little bit, find out what you need to do and then compromise. I liken it to, you know, if you've ever been an elementary school teacher and you've done looping, right? You spend a lot of time going over like, what are my classroom norms? How are we going to get along? What are our relationships going to be? And it's really not really fair to us and it's not fair to our kids to have an experience of, you know, in one class I do Kajit, not Kajit, Kahoot. In the other class I do Pear Deck. In the next class I do Socrative. And the next class I end up doing Pear Deck. Find out which of those we can all live with and then focus deeper on those because only then will you, will you really be able to collaborate with your colleagues and share resources and really go deep with less. If we're spending all this time trying to figure out the nuances of each particular piece of software, we're gonna be in trouble. The other thing is to look for places where you can double dip. So my current favorite tool is Pear Deck. I just love the way the thing functions and looks and the ease of integration to existing systems. So I look at that as a Pear Deck exercise to start my class, and I do this with my PD as well, allows you to, you know, kill some time, kill that, you know, sort of transition time to start the period, allows you to put up a problem, have the kids input the problem, their answer to the problem, and then you can use a feature that's like an overlay and see visually, did all the 25 kids in this class understand the concept? Do I need to reinforce this concept or can I move on with my instruction and move on to the next thing? And the other thing that we're asking teachers to do more and more of in proficiency-based systems is just collecting gobs of formative assessment data and observational data, right? And that's mm -hmm. almost, it's just, that'll eat up all your time if that's all you're doing. And so any chance I have to integrate a tool like that to gather, you know, student engagement, um, are they on task? Are they understanding the concept? Do I need to reteach this? And then the other thing as well is it gives kids afterwards. So all these things, you know, Similarly excellent, I'm sure, but you know, we just decided as a district, this is not to like talk a different language and we don't have to get kids up to speed every year. They come in, they have accounts, it's integrated with our Google, it's got like auto grading and things of that nature. So, where you can double dip because we are going to be asked to do more and more and more. Uh, so I would focus go deeper with you. Know. Did you all find people in your groups who were willing to come up, or did you or um, and and talk about the cha and talk about these challenges? Because um, I'm hoping maybe somebody raised, maybe a couple of people raise their hands and are willing to talk about the challenges that they faced. And this is also your time because since you're talking to <clears throat> If there's things that you leaders should know about what really happens in the classroom or what really happens in the library, this is the time to influence Andy and Leo about things that you want those district leaders to hear. So, um, so yeah, so please. We, we have, we have over a hundred people signed up too. So it'll be a hundred district leaders. Ah. Yeah. Wow. So um, it's, it's let's. Picture. Picture. Uh, it's I, th Andy's I think picture. so. Yeah. So uh, who's going to who's going to raise their hand? It's a, this is a class, Mitch. We just call on people. I mean, we're all okay. teachers here. We know. We know. Okay. Like, absolutely. So uh, you, but definitely. I mean, everyone knows that so that's what happens. But if no one volunteers, I'm, you raise your hand. Like Susan. Susan definitely has to comment now. We haven't heard. Pull the trigger, Leo. Pick someone. Susan's coming up on stage. Nice. Except Mitch has to do it because I don't have the power. She's on the spot. Hey, Susan. Oh, uh, we can't hear you. Hold on. Let me unmute you. I forgot to unmute my mic. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Introduce yourself. That, Where are you from? I'm from Palaka, Florida. I'm the technology integration coach, and I like your method of random reporter. <laughs> So um, we used Pear Deck too. Um, we purchased it for everyone in the district and everybody loves it. We also purchased Canvas. But the big issue is everything that's out there. Because I'm the technology integration specialist, they think that I'm supposed to know how to use every single thing that's out there. 
and they'll email me, text me, call me to their school. Well, you need to come train on this. You need to come train on that. And I'm like, I've never even used it. <laughs> so right. um, it's really yeah. difficult when they do that. So we're trying to use certain ones. Like in math, we um, allow them to use reflex. We'll train them on reflex. Um, and we'll train them on 10 marks because 10 marks is set up a lot like our FSA. The questions are similar, the drag and drop and all that kind of stuff. But um, we do have Canvas, which they're learning how to use. We just wrote it out this year. And so we're hoping that they'll get into using that better so we can go ahead and um, have the personalized learning. But like you're saying, there's just so much out there and the time that it takes and everything that's mandated. I don't know about all the other states and districts, but there's a lot that the teachers have to do and it's just not enough time. And then also a lot of them set in their ways. They're like, well, we've always done it this way. It's always worked. And trying to convince them to try something new is sometimes difficult as well. It's funny, it's funny yeah. you said it. You gotta show them those efficiencies, right. right, Susan? Like show them how this will make your life better, right? I mean, sell right. it that way too. We've tried and that with Canvas. Yep. Because Canvas um, will put their grades in Skyward for them. So once it's graded, it goes into Skyward and it saves them a lot of time. Um, they don't have to worry about like losing papers and it integrates with Google. Excellent. I mean, really, really well. And so if they're already using Google and Google Classroom, now they can extend that and they have speed grader in Canvas, which is really efficient. Uh, it just saves them so much more time. Yeah. That's perfect. So you get those sort of uh, integrated tools that bring efficiencies and have automation, right? And that's perfect. Auto right. rostering, things of that nature. So, I mean, yes. one thing that you can do, you know, where you uh, you can be a leader is helping to define a process by which apps are identified, right? And, you know, they got to know if you, if you have a Porsche, you don't want to bring it to the guy who fixes, you know, pickup trucks. Right, there's, it's the same thing <laughs> exactly. with all these tools you have. Yes, it has four right. wheels and a go, but it doesn't mean you're going to be an expert in it. And so, I encourage like you, like to become like a champion of any one of those particular, you know, people become seesaw ambassadors or, um, right. you know, any of those champions sort of things where you have a credential and you know you can really go further with it, and you right. are the expert. And being humble, right? It's hard. Like I'm the tech director. <laughs> if it plugs in and makes noise, I'm supposed to know how to fix it. But right, that's exactly. Just not a way to fix it <laughs> and if you can't, they get upset. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you so that's much for sharing. And you also mentioned another thing to the state test. But the truth is, if you have things that emulate technology enhanced items on a, a state assessment, then you are in a way using a tool that is engaging your kids, but also sort of you know secretly teaching them the, me the methods for being successful on those tests. And there's no shame in, by the way, getting yourself a ton of Chromebooks or iPads or whatever under the guise of preparing kids for the state test, right? Because if that opens up the coffers, do it. And that was the plan of Massachusetts. I mean, and that's, you know, and that's a lot what our workshop is, uh, is about, um, you know, you know, the, it's really preparing the um, leadership of our districts. You know, it's FETC. We're going to have a lot of, CIOs, um, tech directors, uh, and hopefully some curriculum leaders and some superintendents in the in the room to talk about that. And how do you roll out something like a Canvas? Uh, you know, how do you implement technology in a the least painful way possible? Uh, possible. You know, what are you taking off your plate? You know, how are you going to maximize time? Uh, meet the requirements of things like attendance and state testing, right, and preparation, and still allow for that next generation of pedagogy to, um, you know, to come through, you know, and get into the, you know, the design learning and design thinking, the maker spaces and, and leveraging that next generation learning, you know, in an effective way. So, um, you know, and when we talk about app sprawl, you know, I mean, that's a huge um you know, it's a huge issue, right? I, I did a, we did an audit in one of the small districts uh, about of about 4,500 students in Massachusetts. And I had 50 different applications that we paid for every year. And I had no idea whether who, they, who was paying for them, how often they were used, 
Um, and we had, we just had no idea uh, how they would, um, you know, where they were coming from. So the efficacy of our expenditures and our budgetary process, you know, comes into play as well. So using tools like uh, catch on, for instance, that would help to, um, you know, monitor that use, um, you know, or suggest other tools that are being used in your district uh, as another good way. Um, you know, and the other conversation too, the, that we worry about, uh, today and we hear about, um, you know, in our social emotional learning and our digital citizenship um, and student data privacy, right, or safety. So, and that's a cue, Mitch, to go to our next slide. Um, and you know, you know, a you know, Andy and I had a deep conversation about this today about the safety side of this and just how complex it really is, right? Um, just how safe is you know is, is it. Um, how important is it to build the walled garden? Um, and is the walled garden kind of, you know, shielding our students? Um, and how do we, um, you know, what kind of tools do we leverage to ensure safety? Like, you know, like Gaggle or, um, you know, a tool such as that, that kind of monitors what's happening in Canvas in the chat rooms, because, you know, Susan can't, um, can't be monitoring everybody's chats in, you know, in Canvas. And we prefer them to engage with each other you know, in our walled garden, even though they will probably t text each other directly or direct message and whatever the latest tool is, Snapchat, Instagram. Um, so, you know, what are you all doing um, and how do you look at the safety when you talk about something like um, like Canvas and, and how does it relate to that personalization side, you know, and that social emotional development that we need to foster, you know, in our environments? Andy, what do you think on that? Yeah, I think it's like, so one of, to me, one of the things about personalized learning is that, I mean, I do feel like one-to-one -one technology is a huge, huge enabler. And in fact, anybody who's doing it really well without that level of access to technology is a hero in my mind. But when the trade-off with one-to-one -one technology or supplying ubiquitous access to tech anytime, anywhere learning is they're not always in your environment, right? So we need to look at, like you said, tools like Gaggle, or Go Guardian or Securely. There's a whole bunch of them out there that can help you when the kids are at home. But you know, it all starts with prevention, which is the education. So prevention and education. You got to get the kids into you know be internet awesome, or you got to get them into you know the common common sense media stuff. Or again, you want to look at double dipping. You might want to look at some of the newer tools like Go Announce, which is like a building your LinkedIn profile while learning about digital citizenship and building a portfolio, right? So you yep. look at some of the models that are yep. coming out on the market, they're worth a close look. But, you know, kids are going to make mistakes, so you do need that tech stuff in the background to keep you in compliance. But the other part of uh, safety we don't talk enough about is um, student data privacy and what's happening with our, with our, our information, our students' information, how are we keeping them safe, how are we keeping their data from being sold, and reused on the market. And so you guys, you know, one thing that uh, leaders should be looking at, uh, maybe at the district level, but is, you know, the, the apps that we're using, do they have good safety and privacy policies? Are they willing to sign a pledge or a contract to protect students' data when it's with them or when it's not? You know, that, and when and it's not just for things you buy, too, it's that the free apps are often the worst in that if it doesn't cost anything, you know, your, you, your data is their money in essence, because that's generally speaking how people make money on that. But I would encourage you all to look at um, organizations like um, PTAC and Common Sense Media again, and um, the Student Data Privacy Consortium, which is something I've been pushing and we just adopted here in Maine. Um, because I'm not into legal, I'm not into legalese. I hate reading that garbage. I hate having to write a letter home to a parent asking for kids to read that. an app. So get someone else to do that work for you. Convince your state leaders to adopt something like the Student Data Privacy Consortium for a couple thousand bucks. You don't have to do any more work. You just have to get the vendors to agree to do that. But yeah, definitely, because even the best one-on-one -one program, the best personalized program can be completely derailed because of a data breach or a cyberbullying incident or a sexting scandal or things like that. So we really do need to create an environment that is safe for our kids and where teachers feel like they can personalize and give kids access anywhere, anytime, without feeling like they're putting them in harm's way. 
So don't overlook that part is what I would encourage. I'm going to I'm gonna pull someone else up to talk a little bit about safety. And then what are they doing? It's like, just pick someone randomly. You want to pick someone, Andrew? Oh, I get to pick someone? Yeah, pick someone. Well, let's bring up, uh, let's bring up Susie Brooks. Sorry, Susie. Oh, busted. <laughs> All right, where's the wizard? Where's the wizard behind the curtain? Well, you have to say abracadabra, I think. Oh, it, it worked. There it is. <laughs> All right, Susie. I just so figured there was, you, I figured there was a theme spell, first okay, name. Simply, simply Susie's on the stage. So how are you keeping Susie, your kids you safe? Your use technology, right? One of your jobs? Yeah, yeah. We, right. um, we actually use GoGuardian. Um, and find that it's a great tool not only to be able to just keep an eye on trends, but also to be able to like involve our guidance counselors, our our support staff in the school to be to be able to kind of have like a wraparound service for our students. So we'll get alerts and then check the background of what the kids have been looking up or what videos they've been watching or what Google searches they've been doing. And then we're able to pull in people that can help support those students for different reasons. So it's it's been a very valuable tool for us. So you find teachable moments out of using the tool? We do. Yeah, we do. We see a lot of stuff that you'd be surprised by and shocked by and saddened by and concerned by. So um, it's it's been worth it for us. Yeah, and it's one of those, like, I'm, I'm the guy who gets those alerts in my district. I'm one of the people. And it's like, it can ruin your weekend, but at the same time, you know, you're in a way glad that they're making these mistakes uh, in a way where you can try to intervene and, and help and reach out to the families too and help them understand what's going on or the broader community, what you're doing, because you care about their kids and you want them to be safe. Yeah, that's the message that they get too. To mm -hmm. And do, you th do teachers worry about kids' safety, like, or... Is that an excuse to not use technology? Do you think or a barrier? Um, or I think okay? that they're definitely. I know. I think that they're definitely concerned about it. Um, I don't think they have. Um, I don't know. I don't think because they don't have that same window into what they're doing. They're getting better at asking us to support them, but um, yeah, I think that it's something that they are worried about. Colleen also does the same job that I do, so we work on the same. Um, the same platform and we're looking at the same kids so it helps to have somebody else to talk to about what you're seeing and um, what you're thinking and what your hunch might be so I find that teachers if they're able to to ask someone else or talk to someone else that's helpful as well that's a good point too and right uh, I'll be honest with you am I an expert on how to deal with kids doing self-harm let's say so it's really like this technology stuff is no longer just about computers right it really brings right. in social workers parents, guidance counselors, sadly, sometimes law enforcement, and then us to sort of sift through it. But it's a whole new world for me. Just, Absolutely. All right, thanks so much for thanks. involuntarily being dragged up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Andy, we uh, made it to the 9 o'clock hour. Oh, we made it to the 9 o'clock. Oh, we got one more. Matthew's coming up. I feel more safe now with Matt up here, actually. <laughs> well, I actually wanted to share a real-time story today. Um, sadly, I guess, but also add to the conversation. Um, we do use Gaggle, um, and we had a student um, who was in was hospitalized, high school student, and back to school for last week and wrote something this morning at 3 o'clock, um, and the tool picked it up, and we had somebody at his house by 4.30 um, and intervened. So... Um, Everything was fine, safe. It was just kind of a cry for help. But the tools that are out there are really working. And I'm not a salesperson for any of them. I'm just somebody in this uh, in this field for the really the last 13 Gaggle, months. Yes. Yeah, so we used Gaggle, and Gaggle um, had an alert um, when the student wrote something about self harm. And I raised my hand because that, uh, Andy just talked about that. Um, and then we have a hierarchy tree of who's contacted, and the correct people were contacted. Somebody went to the house, did a valuation, and the student was back 
you know, in school by midday. Great. So it really uh, does work. And um, there's some scary situations and there's some nonsensical situations where the eighth graders are just trying to make sure people are watching or whatever and writing nonsense. And I'm learning a lot about weekends in, in, in Milford. But um, <laughs> the, the tool itself, the thing that I used to say as a principal, um, is I have two things. I have to make sure your kids have the best education and make sure they're safe. And now I can say the same thing in this role um, with some of these digital tools that that Andy and Leo were talking about. That's it. Great. Now we're up against time. Does anybody have any last things they want to say? And yeah, Eric mentions that Gaggle monitors your Google environment. Um, so like we yeah, basically create a social network for kids by giving them Google Apps, a collaborative network, which is wonderful. So and actually, then they go down down. And really do more okay. of the. That's not they now integrate into LMS now too, so they'll integrate with Schoology and Canvas um, oh, and cool. Google Classroom. So uh, that's actually a really smart move on their part, and uh, I absolutely do appreciate it. I mean, I remember when we set up our first Moodle instance about you know 15 years ago, uh, maybe a little more, yeah, maybe a little less, and uh, you had those list of swear words that you would get flagged if it showed up anywhere in a post, and um, I remember seeing the first one to come through uh, of what you know, WTF was, and I asked the student, you know, what's WTF mean? And they said, why the face? So. <laughs> it's a great way to learn new lingo. And know That's what's right. Going on. Yeah, you got to ask the kids. Absolutely. So. All right. So anyway, we hope that you continue to explore, you know, personalized um, learning technology because it really does engage students. And we know it can get you to the next level uh, on things like, it might not seem like there's a tangible link between you know, your standardized test and having a kid explore what their interests and passions are about. But there really is. And the other thing, too, is keep an eye out on the notion of, um, I think Mitch had said it earlier, like, what is the data to collect? So the emerging field is going to be around OER and around tagging OER, not just for, like, standards, right? Anybody can link it to the Common Core or the Rhode Island State Standards or whatever. But the real tags that we're going to start looking for, and we're going to need an army of curators, honestly, is around like, this works for 14 year old boys who really like dirt bikes, but don't like to read novels. You know, that level of meta tagging, while seemingly creepy, is really what's gonna work. It's really what's gonna get us over the hump between, you know, what we've always been doing, which is trying just to link to standards and go into the next level of really personalizing. Nothing though, you know, is better than getting to know your kids and inventorying them and doing, you know, surveys to find out what they're interested in and trying your best to give up a little of the control and let them pursue things that are more closely linked to their passions. But but we are probably out of time here. We got Mitch, yeah, you sorry. got closing yeah. words. Well, so, I, you know, actually, so I, as, uh, as usual, I'm going to muddy the waters a little bit because, you know, a lot of what you've talked about is safety, you know, with uh, Gaggle and, um, you know, and GoGuardian and, and tools like that. And, you know, I was also thinking, and, and also about the fact that we, ha we have a, a proliferation of tools and that kind of prevents us to, from really figuring out how to personalize. And I guess one of my, the areas that I'm really most interested in is tools that serve as sandboxes, tools that allow kids to, to kind of create and personalize that way. Um, and, you know, obviously Minecraft, which is happens to be very expensive, but but is an example, but other other tools. And I was just I was wondering about your thoughts on tools like that to allow teachers to personalize the learning environment for their kids. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, that's the that's the whole purpose of this. Um, you know, this implement tools, leverage. Leveraging um, IMS to the play mm -hmm. environment. Um, so, you know, this is about how do you leverage makerspaces effectively and plug them in right. to meet the standards you're trying to um, adhere to, right? Mm -hmm. Andy hit the nail on the head to Susan earlier. You know, we still have uh, state tests uh, and mandated tests that help to keep us accountable, right? Um, right. But how do we ha take the time to take advantage of things like? Um, makerspaces and design thinking and effectively plug it into our ecosystem. And so uh, that's a lot of the work that we've been engaged in. 
um, myself, Eric Butash, and uh, Andy, and some others across the country at IMS, uh, working with partner uh, tools to say, all right, you know, I'm in Canvas. We have digital portfolios. How am I going to leverage that to, you know, to take the place of this uh, science lesson that I usually do? So I'm going to give the kids a problem. They're going to go out to a tool like Babbitt School from Fable Vision or Maker's Empire, and I'm going to design a new widget to solve the problem. And then using those standards, I'm going to bring a representation back of that widget that I designed. And I'm going to explain mm -hmm. how this this widget is going to solve the problem, and yeah. that's the design process that kids can engage in. And then we, because it's back in the canvas, it's back in the environment that we've trained the student, the teachers to to operate in. They can apply a rubric to that, so they can build out a rubric in that digital portfolio that uh, allows them to apply design thinking and meet standards, so that they can show competency. Right, and that's a shift into competency-based learning, which, and here in Massachusetts, right. you know, we're far behind. You know, uh, you know, Rhode Island and and um, and Maine are a little bit ahead of us on that, or quite a bit ahead of us. So, you know, but we're in Massachusetts, and we're number one, so we don't need to do anything. We're, we're right. Perfect. You're gonna, you're, you yeah, have more good. people anyhow. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, I would put in one last plug for things like this is what this is what I like to say to teachers is you are mastered teachers and you you understand what learning looks like and what mastery of learning looks like and demonstration of skills looks like. And so don't be so concerned about how the kid gets to that level. You know, if kids are gonna go off and do Minecraft for EDU or some of the new promising games from uh, teachergaming.com or Roblox, I don't know if you've seen R-O-B-L-O-C-X, uh, these websites where kids can go and create stuff and they will innately demonstrate mastery of many, many concepts. And teachers don't, you don't have to feel like you have to do that th same thing in order to appreciate the learning and the demonstration skills. Um, mm -hmm. So I just encourage teachers to trust their instincts and let the kids personalize and get to the end goal through whatever pathway they might choose and just trust yourself. It's like, I love sculpture. I couldn't make a sculpture, but I know that that sculpture sends a message to me and it has value and it communicated something to me. So think of your kids in that way and think of yourself as a master assess, assessor, so to speak. And then you're going to find that when kids personalize, they're going to just be so much more efficient and interesting. So, yeah. so I'd like to find out just um, if people can put this into the chat window or reply to the email uh, that, I, that I sent out earlier about how to come on to here. Just what are one or two things that you picked up from tonight? Because I hope that everybody got some tidbits that they can take back to their schools and use, you know, use tomorrow and use and use in the next week. And um, I hope you all also uh, consider coming down to FETC and attending the workshop that Andy and Leo were doing. It sounds um, it sounds very comprehensive, and it sounds like it's going to really pave the way for uh, districts, schools, and teachers to better personalize learning so that every kid can su can succeed. So um, thank you. Do you have do you have a final, uh, Andy, Leo? You have a final uh, statement that you'd like to make? Yeah, uh, take risks. You know, it's um, and and model that for your teachers. There's, there's nothing um, there's nothing worse than being in technology and being that technology leader in your building and saying no. And um, because when teachers um, have the initiative to 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 take a risk and have a a great idea, even though it might fail. Failure is is learning, and we have to model that, you know, in, in leadership. And even, you know, you're all technology specialists here in the space, and that means you're definitely probably the only person in your building that does your job. Chances are, and that makes you a leader in that space. So, so I, I just have to say, you know, like I'm over 210 pounds, so I'm too big to fail. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andy, how about you? Closing, uh, closing. I time? would just say, like you know, feel just empower your kids. Try to find, you know, find out what motivates them, and then let them do it. Put the learning in their hands, and the in the assessment of the learning or for the learning in your hands. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll see you both at FETC and online. And uh, before then, thank you very much for coming up on EdChat Interactive. Um, Andy, if you need some technical support next time, uh, don't call me. <laughs> but uh, Leo's right there to help you. 
Yeah, is that your neighbor's house? <laughs> yeah, yeah, my neighbor's. No, I don't have a nice office like this. This is great. Look at this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, 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 see you all soon. Um, take care. Bye. Well, and this you. is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive, and uh, hope to see you on November 20th, and uh, and and at our other future events. Take care and goodbye.